we are going to hear from Rabbi Mark Krauss, who some of you probably know and many of you probably don't, but you will soon. Mark it has been a member of ECAR for a long time. He's a rabbi and also a therapist and really just a, a great human being. And so we are very grateful that he uh, is going to share some Torah with us this morning. Shabbat shalom, friends. I'm deeply grateful to have been asked to offer some words of Torah this morning. Um, in case you're having difficulty understanding me, um, it may help to know that Rabbi Silva and I share a common point of origin, namely a small island off the coast of France. <laughs> and speaking of old Blighty, my loved ones and I make a pilgrimage back there to see family each year. Three uncles, three aunts, two siblings, one nephew, 10 first cousins, 13 cousins once removed. But most importantly, my parents. My parents, thank God, are in good health and good spirits. Raising my siblings and I was a Herculean task. And at this point, they're enjoying a less stressful retirement. They are not the same people they were when I left the UK 15 years ago, nor am I the same person I was then. However, around my, my parents, I must confess that something rather alarming happens to me. Perhaps you've experienced something like this too. There are moments where I feel like my 18-year-old self. I begin unearthing old disagreements, rubbing salt in old wounds, and just generally being juvenile. As disturbing as this pattern of behavior may sound, no offense to any juvenile youngsters here, um, it's not altogether incomprehensible. These were ways for my teenage self to redress old grievances, to assert control, and to distinguish myself from my family. Patterns in our behavior are pervasive. They are distinctive markers of our personality and character. Yet sometimes, patterns that are less than helpful, less adaptive, less appropriate to context, become part of our lives. Often, we'll notice other people engaging in patterns that make no sense to us. It is these patterns that I'd like to address today. These patterns, though, often frustrating and seemingly maladaptive, once served as strategies for survival or for mal managing challenging realities. To put it in a nutshell, patterns have purpose. Today I'm going to tell you two stories, one about the tribes of Reuven and Gad, and another about a guy named Peter. In both, we'll see different examples of patterns playing out. In the Torah, we see many times following the Exodus that the Israelites complain over and over ad nauseum, we had it better in Egypt. During the wilderness sojourn in the book of Bamidbar, this pattern of complaints takes a dramatic turn. Everything went wrong when spies were sent to get a sense of the promised land and ended up returning in a panic describing the land as one that consumes its inhabitants and that they could not possibly go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to fight against the far stronger inhabitants of the land. Enraged, God tells the children of Israel that they must wander in the wilderness until that entire generation is dead and a new generation, a more enterprising generation, might be ready to give it a go. Yet when they are finally deemed ready, they hit a snag. Two tribes ask to stay behind on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Moses cannot believe what he is hearing. It's his worst nightmare. It's a new metastasized version of the pattern in which the Israelites are asking to go back to Egypt. He assumes that just like the morale-crushing report brought back by the spies, this decision will have profound consequences for the morale and for the Israelite project as a whole. Moses' tirade is long, but two verses in particular stand out. 
האחיכם יבואו למלחמה ואתם תשבו פה? ולמה תניעון את לב בני ישראל מעבור אל הארץ אשר נתן להם אדוני? At first glance, Moses seems to be asking a moral question. How is it okay for you guys to sit this one out? However, Rabbi Ovadia Sforno writing in the 16th century words this very differently. Did you really think that your fellow, fellow Israelites would be willing to launch a war of conquest without you? It would utterly undermine their morale. Have you forgotten the punishment suffered by the previous generation who said what you're saying now? For Sforno, the political implications here are disastrous. This isn't about whether it would be unfair for a few tribes to sit out the war. Reuven and Gad are deliberately sabotaging the entire Israelite project. They know that if they stay put, nobody else will have the courage to go and fight. They've decided that they don't care about entering the land at all. Why would the tribes of Reuven and Gad want to do this? Why would they want to sabotage this project? The, main, the plain implication in context, as Rashi puts it, is that they're terrified of the military strength of the enemy. But in broader context, though, this is again part of the same pattern we've seen from the Israelites over and over. Why go any further if after decades of wandering, they have finally found some land that can support them and their families? They've been traumatized by years of wilderness deprivation, divine plagues, internecine tribal bloodshed and crushing grief. They've learned that this God will not go easy on them for a second. The war to conquer someone else's homeland will be brutal and bloody. The fracas with the other tribes will not stop. As the Midrash insinuates, they're trying to quit while they're ahead, leaving God's project for good. This fearful behavior that Moses is so incensed by, behavior that has come up over and over again throughout the journey to the promised land, is simply another desperate attempt at self-preservation, a pattern if you will. They've been through so much, who wouldn't try to save themselves when the first viable piece of land turns up? Reuven and Gad, just like the Israelites more generally, are simply trying to survive. Their repetitive patterns of behavior stem from deep-seated fears, traumatic experiences, and past challenges. The same is true of the patterns we observe in ourselves and others today. I promised you a second story about patterns. And working as a therapist, I have plenty. A huge part of my job is helping my clients notice and understand the origins of their patterns. Let me introduce you to Pete. Pete is a musician in his late 20s. He grew up in an affluent household. He identifies as both black and gay. Pete comes across as a happy-go-lucky, extremely affable guy. And after, I, uh, after I'd spent some time with Pete, he was willing to admit that his always smiling exterior was really a mask in many ways. He worries constantly about not pleasing people or not saying yes to the opportunity that might give him his big break. His friends say that he lives like a feather, every time his phone rings, with an invitation to a club or a concert, he feels like he has to say yes and drink all night because that's what everyone else is doing. The problem is he ends up going almost every night of the, wing, every night of the week and drinking far more than he would like. There's something similar going on with his work and work opportunities. He believes he has to be available at all times. He went to a prestigious music school and feels intense pressure to be successful as an artist. His parents tell him that whatever it is, he can do it. And when it comes to rejection, Pete, take, Pete takes it really hard. He has this belief that if he does everything right, people will like him. And inevitably, when they don't, he has only himself to blame. Pete's perpetual question is, 
Why do I always feel like I'm under so much pressure to be liked and successful? All of that, his people-pleasing, his difficulty setting boundaries, his difficulty with rejection, his sense of constantly being under pressure, those make up Pete's pattern. So what's it all about? When we dig into issues of race and sexuality, things become clearer. As a black kid growing up in majority white settings, Pete experienced what he called polite racism on an almost daily basis, and sometimes less polite. His classmates would assume he was poor and end arguments with lines like, at least my dad is in my life. By the way, Pete's dad is a doctor and is very much part of his life. Pete's parents had to sit down and tell him, as a black kid, you can't get away with the things that other people can do. You can't afford to ruffle feathers. Pete internalized that idea. He had to keep everyone happy in order to be successful and in order to stay safe. But there's a catch. Pete is a gay man and part of a community that often finds that difficult to process. His aunts repeatedly told him as a kid, you can't like shoes, that's for girls. Or responded to him greeting his friends saying, men don't hug men. When I met him, again, a man in his late 20s, his parents were still convinced the gay thing was just a phase. His dad wouldn't even acknowledge it, except to leave dire health warnings on his desk. And God forbid if the extended family found out. Pete was living and had always lived as an outsider without a home. At school and work, he was the token black guy. In his community, he had to pretend he wasn't gay. When you don't feel comfortable anywhere and live in limbo, you try to please everyone so you can't say no to anyone and reminders of your loneliness are gut-wrenching. Just as the tribes of Reuven and Gad reverted to familiar patterns in response to fear and uncertainty, Pete developed his own set of patterns to try to avoid the pain of loneliness. All of us have patterns. Some of these patterns, though often frustrating to ourselves or to others, once served a crucial purpose. They were strategies for survival and managing the complex situations in which we found ourselves. I've managed to find a little compassion for my own juvenile patterns around my parents. And with compassion and mindfulness comes the capacity to begin to change. So this is my challenge to you this Shabbat. The next time you notice yourself repeating a pattern that seems irrational, or you recognize bizarre or frustrating patterns in someone else, try to approach what you see with greater curiosity and empathy. Whether we look to the ancient Israelites, to ourselves, or to those around us, patterns have purpose. By having compassion and understanding their origins, we can begin to transform them into healthier, more adaptive ways of being. Shabbat Shalom.